everybody. We are so excited to be welcoming back Sophia and Colin. Um, so excited that they can be with us this week. And also a special shout out to our friend Trevor McCord, who's back. Nice. Um, so we're going to dive into some worship now. And uh, wherever you're at, we just hope that you would consider lending your voice and worshiping along with us.
chasing of the wind, the powers of the earth, so pale and thin, we will set our hearts on you again. Heaven taunts the hearts of men We can feel it from within The beauty of it all The mystery The swelling of a voice A rising sea the mystery of it all I can never peer within I'll never find the words or understand the fullness of a God become fools for you kingdoms to ruins for you vapor finds ground in you music finds sound in you everything rising everything rising everything rising sing it
Hello, Annex friends. It is me, Boris, a uh, long time Annex man from coming at you live from Serbia up in the icy butthole. Uh, announcements this week uh, online games are ongoing 7 30 Wednesday night. Be sure to be there. Very fun. Lots of friends. Very good time. Also, service opportunities. Thursday, Friday, with and uh, the Deacon's Closet. Very cool. You'll get to hang out and serve. Very fun. Jesus, good time. Uh, uh, Zoom meetings. You might have missed this week, but next week, 7 30 before, uh, uh, seven, uh, before Annex. You come hang out with Annex people before we see Jesus talk. Uh, also, tomorrow, Rise and Shine for females. You come, you come Bible study, 9 o'clock, to, to talk about Jesus with girls. Uh, that is all announcements for this week of Annex. I must go milk wolf. What's up, Annex? Uh, Sam Dom here. I'm a sophomore for those who don't know me already. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give a quick prayer to set us into the message that Dave has prepared. So I um, hope you're all having a good Tuesday night. And yeah, bow your heads with me. So, uh, dear Lord, uh, thank you for today. I uh, thank you for just the many blessings that uh, you have provided us that just go unnoticed, Lord. Um, I pray that tonight. Uh, the message that Dave has prepared, Lord, uh, that you guide us into actively learning and listening uh, to what he has said, that the Spirit, Lord, moves within us and it guides us, uh, and that our hearts are softened and our ears are open so that we may listen intently, Lord, um, and that whatever Dave speaks unto us, Lord, that we're able to take action in that, that that doesn't fall upon deaf ears, Lord, um, that the seeds fall on good soil, Lord, and we're able to prosper from that uh, and grow closer to you, Lord. So I pray for your spirit over everybody listening. I pray for your spirit over Dave. Um, and so I just thank you for your name. I thank you for everything you've done for us. Um, so yeah, thank you, Lord. Love you. Love you, Jesus. And in your great name, amen. If there's a God, and that God really is king of all things, what would that God be like as a human? just like us? And what would it look like if that God entered our world? A world of pandemics, social unrest, uncertainty, and fear? What would he be like? What would he do? And would we want him to be our king? This is the story that the Gospel of Mark tells, an account of the life of Jesus about God entering the hardest parts of being human to show us that he is king. Hey everybody, um, welcome to Tuesday night. I'm Dave Palmer here and uh, it's just another, another Tuesday. What a year this last week has been. Um, just more exciting twists and turns in uh, the time of COVID and um, historic wildfires. Uh, you never can tell how exciting 2020 is gonna get until the next, the next week rolls along. Um, I am really grateful to get to share um, a word from uh, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 10 um, with you all. Uh, to me, it's a really important passage um, because it, it, it entails a guy who I think um, you might really rec uh, recognize maybe in yourself asking a question that um, I, and I think many of us, would want to ask Jesus if we had the opportunity to ask him. And he does it, and I'm so glad he asked the question I don't think that he liked the answer he got from Jesus, but I think we need to hear the answer that Jesus gave. And I think it's actually really important that we hear this answer today in a time of upheaval in our own lives um, because of what it means for us being invited into real life in Jesus. And so here we are in Mark um, chapter 10, and this is how the passage goes. It says, as Jesus started on his way, so Jesus is going somewhere, a man ran up to him, and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
what do I need to do to get into heaven is maybe another way that we might ask that in 2020. Um, I think that's a pretty good question. What do I got to do to get into heaven? Like, what's the way to life um, and, and, uh, by the way of, of God? And, um, and, and this man seems to be um, an embodiment of just um, zealousness. He seems like a good, upright guy. Verse uh, 18, Jesus responds. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. So Jesus recognizes in this response who this man is. This is a, um, a zealous Jewish man who understands Torah, who understands the law of God, the things that you are, that God had clarified and said, this is the way that, um, that brings life to you and to other people. When you live this way, when you make these choices, when you follow these commands, then you are going to experience wholeness and thriving when you live this way. And that is the law, the clarification of that life. And, um, and so Jesus says, you know what, you know what it looks like um, here are some of those important commandments, and he rattles these commandments off. The uh, young man responds, he says, teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now you've got to think, think about what that would mean. You know, you're talking to like Rabbi Jesus, and clearly he thinks really highly of Rabbi Jesus because he's so excited and both humbled to be in the presence of Jesus, that he's on his knees asking this question. Um, and, uh, and then he responds with this confidence. I've kept those laws, but, but what else is there? I still have a doubt. There's still something I think missing in my own life that doesn't quite make sense. And I need you to explain it to me. So Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And friends, maybe I just, uh, if there's a way that you can just hear that. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And as Jesus knows this word that we're about to hear, know this. He looks at us now and loves us and says this. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. He says, go give away your stuff, and then you'll have stuff that actually lasts and matters, and come be my disciple. Be under my tutelage um, as, a, as a student and live my life. Follow me. Verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. He went away very sad. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Wow. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. See, for the disciples, this young man who was zealous of the law, he cared about the law, he was religious to a T. He did things right, he did the godly thing, he knew the law and he practiced it. He was so confident in his own moral behavior that he said, I followed those laws, Rabbi Jesus. That's the sort of guy he is, and he's rich. He's young, he's hot, he's rich, he's got his life together. And Jesus then says something that these disciples cannot believe because in their paradigm, the sign of a godly life, a God-blessed life, was backed up by worldly wealth. People who are in good in the world are in good um, with God. People who are in good, uh, good with wealth are in good with God. 
If you're poor, maybe there's something the matter with you in terms of the way that you are following the commands of God. But if you are rich, that can often be an affirmation of goodness and blessing in your life. And so these men are, are wondering, what in the world, if this man, if this man, if it is difficult for this man to enter the kingdom of God, like what does it mean for me? So in this one stroke, Jesus flips the paradigm of who is in and who is out by saying it's actually hard for wealthy people to be in the kingdom of God. And the disciples are amazed. But Jesus said again, children, how hard it is for, um, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier, um, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed and they said to one another, to each other, who who can be saved? How is this possible? Then Jesus looked at him, looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible with God, is his response. And there's so much to unpack here, but I think that this um, passage tonight provokes one really, really essential question that Jesus, I think in a very direct way, um, without actually saying it explicitly, um, asks of this man and asks of us. What is the source of salvation in your life? What is the source of salvation in your life? What is the thing that you need in order for your life to work out. Another way of thinking of this is, what is the thing that if it were to disappear from your life, to be taken from your life, your life would fall apart? What is it the thing that you're pursuing and desiring because um, you believe that if you were to have it in fullness, without being able to lose it, that everything would work out for you? That's salvation. What is it that you understand to be salvation in your life? And when Jesus asks this question of this rich man, what he is getting to is that for this man, seeking after the kingdom of God, seeking after the right religious ways, the the good obedience to the commands of God, for him was not actually the essential thing that was keeping his whole life together. What it was was the promise and power um, and comfort and security of material wealth, which he already had. Which is why when Jesus said, one thing that you lack, go and sell your worldly belongings and follow me. He, he, he identifies, he puts the scalpel on, that, on the point in this, this man's life that for him, the thing that was holding his life together was his wealth. Not God, not trusting on God to be the one, the source Um, that would hold his life together, it was was his wealth. I'm going to talk more on Thursday morning in our There's More Thursday, um, specifically about wealth and the warnings around wealth, because Jesus talks a lot about that. And that's a really central part of this passage. But I think an even higher concept is this idea of salvation. So many of us believe that wealth is salvation, the thing that we need in order for our lives to work out. And Jesus is saying really quickly, nope, that's not going to do it. But for many of us, it isn't wealth. There are other things that we um, desire, the things that we need, the things that we expect to hold our lives together, the things we are terrified will be taken away from us um, and would have our life fall apart. Um, For me, um, I I had a a moment um, similar to this with Jesus. um, And it was uh, a few years ago. Uh, several years after I graduated from, um, from the University of Washington, I had done a couple of pit stops in college ministry as an intern, first in Seattle um, and then in Malibu, California. And after my internship in Malibu, California, I thought a couple things. One, um, this gal, Aaron, I'm dating is so phenomenal um, and uh, so unexpected and such a gift. Um, I-, I am going to do whatever I have to do to be in position to marry this woman. The second thing I was thinking after those two internships was, I think the Lord's calling me to college ministry. 
And, um, and so I began uh, in earnest a degree from Fuller Seminary. Um, I was um, grinding as a, I was a secretary uh, for, <laughs> for a while working in an office. And you have to know how ironic that is because of how terrible I am at administrative tasks. So I basically answered a phone that never rang. And when I did answer it, um, I didn't know how to. And that was my life, um, all for the sake of being with Aaron and hoping a door would open in college ministry. And time passed and soon um, this uh, particular job I was anticipated would open, but really hoping I could get opened up. And it was the college director position at Malibu Press. So the gig is college ministry, Pepperdine students working in the middle of Malibu. Um, my few, uh, well, girlfriend at the time was working in the city and this was gonna be perfect, right? This was the job, the right fit, a church I loved, the whole thing. And so I applied for the job and get into the interview process. I'm feeling good. I'm like, why would I not get hired for this job on paper? It's a perfect fit. And also with the Lord, I'm like, Lord, what have I not done to deserve this? And, I, and, and I'm a great guy and I do college ministry. And remember the time I worked for like four bucks an hour for like two years and lived in somebody else's house just for you. Remember that? So you're gonna like hook it up, right? So that's my mindset coming into this particular job. Well, um, one night along the way, and the process of hiring was super long and very drawn out, but one night along the way, I get a call from a friend and he said, Dave, you gotta know something. This committee is 50-50 on you and another guy. And there's a, there's a real chance you're not gonna get this job. And man, if I'm honest, I was devastated. Um, I, I was like this rich young man at the feet of Jesus saying, what do I got to do? And when I heard the prospect of what I wanted not working out, my whole face and countenance fell. And I'll be honest, I raged to the Lord for days and days. Lord, how can I possibly be in this position? I need this job. I need it to marry this beautiful girl, Erin. I need it because otherwise I've been wasting my time in college ministry. I need it because I am an important part of the kingdom of God. Uh, and don't you see that? Like you need me sort of a thing. And um, it went on for days and days and days, um, losing sleep more and more each night, feeling restless and destroyed and, and really burned down. Wondering, Lord, resolution, please. Until um, there came a day when the Lord um, finally had my attention. And I was sitting alone um, on the beach in, in Malibu. It was a cloudy day, one of these surreal days that you get in Malibu where low clouds, very still, and everything feels static except for the waves breaking. And I'm sitting there and I asked the Lord, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? I know what I want from you, but what do you want from me? And I heard the Lord say, Dave, I'm not interested so much in what job you do, the things that you want. All of that could be a total waste. Those are good things, but all of that could be a total waste. This is what I want from you. I want you to trust me and I want you to be faithful to where I'm leading you. That's it. And the rest is all gonna work out. Is that what you want too? Or is this entire thing dependent on you getting exactly what you want? And I think that's what this man, this moment, this man is having with Jesus. It's like, Jesus, I want all of the benefits of following you and I want all of the stuff that I want too. And in fact, I think if you give me all of that stuff too, then I'll actually be a better follower. And what Jesus is saying is there is nothing that I could give you except for myself that is more important than me. What you need is to follow me, to understand who I am and what I provide. What you need is to understand that I am, I am true salvation. I am the only one that can hold your life together. I am the only one that when I leave, your life falls apart. And the brilliant thing about Jesus is, is that he will not leave us. So why chase after all of these other things? that might seem like good solutions to the salvation problem that you have, but really do not work in the long run. 
I think so many of us right now in this, this really historical time with the pandemic, the uncertainty, um, every day it feels like there's this new sort of like crisis issue that maybe directly or indirectly um, affects us. And, and maybe it's like you're not feeling like Jesus might be like, call, like calling you away from something. You already feel like it's all been taken from you. And you're wondering like, this is life, Jesus? Like this is what it is? Isolation from my friends, uncertainty about the future, I'm getting sick, the fear of all of this political climate in the air. This is what it is. I think Jesus, what he's speaking to us is, first, he looks at us and he loves us. He says, even if all of that stuff were the way you wanted it, if you believed that that was your salvation, you would be lost. Jesus is not afraid of a bit of chaos or discomfort if it means that we clearly understand who he is and who we are and what we need. So friends, the invitation is this. The question is this. What is your salvation? What is the thing that holds your life together? The thing that you need, otherwise your life falls apart. And Jesus says, I am the only one that can be that. So friends, let us um, let go of the things that might distract us from that call and that invitation and seek after the only one who is true life, and that is Jesus. Let's pray. Um, King Jesus, we are, um, I, I think, I've, I feel both um, freedom and fear when I um, hear these words and I read this story. Fear in that um, so often, Lord, I, I, as somebody who understands um, and experiences the power of wealth, um, the pleasure of comfort, the things that I think so many of us experience that um, feel like, man, we need those things, otherwise our life falls apart. Lord, I, I, I want myself and I pray for us to be open to the, the way that we um, make these material things um, into our salvation. And at the same time, Lord, we um, hear the invitation of freedom, this invitation that it is you and your kingdom that sets us free from the bondage of slavery of false gods and saviors that cannot save. Whether they be internships, whether they be career um, aspirations, whether they be relational aspirations. Lord, our hearts are filled with so many desires that um, so often compete with this one clear call and proclamation of you as Savior. So Lord, even now in this time of trouble for so many of us, would you reveal yourself to be the only one true Savior, the only one that can hold our lives together in all of life's circumstances? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
mercy triumphs over judgment. I know that you delight in showing mercy. And mercy triumphs over judgment. Hey friends, thanks again for being with us tonight at Annex. Um, remember this as we go into the week. First, Jesus like, looks at us and he, he loves us. He has so much affection for you and I as his beloved children. Uh, and second is this, the, the Lord is, is not in the business of um, making our life work out the way we want it to. He's in the business of, of saving us, of being our true savior. And so rather than looking to him this week to put back everything, you know, um, structurally or cosmetically or um, in terms of just the discomfort of your life, put that all back together so that you can get on with living. Um, Jesus um, simply is inviting you to do this, to trust him and then to follow him as your one true savior. And in that, we will find true life. So let's do that this week. And all God's people said, amen.